It occurred to me um, just a little while ago that this coming week is actually a significant milestone in my life that I had never really thought about. But this coming week will mark the 30th anniversary of me being a fully licensed driver on the streets of Ontario, which is uh, good news for nobody, <laughs> really. But it got me thinking back to my driver's education at Foster's Driving School. It used to be on St. Paul Street in St. Catharines. And I, and I literally, I have two memories that linger of my time at Foster's Driving School. This is the sum total of my driver's education right here. The first is a memory of our instructor talking about stale green lights. Well, the definition of a stale green light is a light that has been green for as long as you can see it. And the point the instructor was making was that you can reasonably anticipate that in short order, it's going to turn yellow and red. And so since we drive defensively, as we approach a stale green light, we ease off the gas. We begin to prepare to depress the brake in order to ready ourselves for the fact that this light is going to turn red at some point soon. Valid point. The question I asked, I put up my hand and I said, does the same theory hold for stale red lights? So the question is, if a light has been red for as long as I can see it, presumably it's going to turn green sometime soon. And as I approach the intersection, should I prepare by leaning a little heavier on the gas and getting, getting ready to shoot through the green light when it inevitably turns? And she assured me uh, that that was not the case. <laughs> hasn't stopped me, but, it, but she insists we shouldn't do it. The only other memory, and that's sort of indicative of, of how the driver I actually became out of Foster's Driving School. The only other memory I have was of a little rhyme that they taught us. They repeated this rhyme all the time until it was drilled in our heads, and probably the Foster's Driving students among us could repeat it with me. But the rhyme goes like this. It isn't any trouble... Just to S-M-I-L-E, to smile. It isn't any trouble just to drive defensively. So when you are in trouble, it will vanish like a bubble. If you only take the trouble just to drive defensively. It's amazing the legacy that that little rhyme has after 30 years. It's probably dictated very little of my driving choices over the years. But what it represents is the distilled core the beating heart of Foster's driving school education. As far as they were concerned, that little rhyme captures everything or the essential things that you need to know about what it means to drive a car responsibly. It's not everything you need to know, but it is the beating heart of what it means to be a responsible driver. And sometimes... The most profoundly helpful thing someone can do is take something that is complicated and vast and confusing, like dr driving a car, and distill it down to its essence, something you can wrap your arms around and say, okay, there's lots still to figure out, but I get it now. I get what this is about. And as a part of our Refreshing Faith series, that was one of the things that we wanted to do. We wanted to devote a morning to distilling what it means to believe as a Christian down to its essential core, down to its beating heart, down to the, the core of what sits in the middle. Because at the end of the day, to be perfectly honest, this is a big fat book. It's complex. There are very difficult parts to understand. There's a lot going on in the Bible. And, the, and, and in a situation like that, it could be incredibly helpful to say, okay, let's set aside all the nuance and all the complexity and everything that's confusing. Let's, let's just put that aside for a moment. Here's the heart of what this is all about. And so for this morning, for our faith refresher, uh, as we talk about the heart of what it means to believe in Jesus as a Christian, we want to look at the instrument the church has always used to capture the beating heart of a faith in Jesus, which is the Apostles' Creed. The Apostles' Creed takes 
the entire story of the good news of Jesus that is described comprehensively in here. And it boils it down to its essence. And it says, you know, whatever else, there's lots of stuff that isn't included in the Apostles' Creed. But right from the earliest centuries of the church, it has been the way people say this is the essential core of what it means to believe in Jesus. In a sense, it's, it's kind of like a, a wedding vow, right? Wedding vows describe the heart of what it means to be married. It, it says, you know, we will be together no matter what the circumstances. We will love and cherish each other. We'll be faithful to each other. And we commit ourselves to each other until death ends the relationship for one of the two of us. That, that's the heart of what it means to be married. Now, there's lots of things the wedding vow doesn't talk about. It doesn't talk about whether or not we're going to have kids and how we will parent them. It doesn't talk about whose family we're going to visit on Christmas Day. It doesn't talk about the proper way to stack a dishwasher or who gets to control the remote. There's lots of marriage complexity that isn't included. But, but if you have this, if you have these things, that's what it takes to have a marriage. That's what the Apostles' Creed is. The summary of beliefs that emerged in the first century or two of the life of the Christian church. But it's not just a summary of the things that Christians believe. It's actually how people in the earliest days of the church became a Christian. Because words don't just inform, words perform. They do things. When you make a promise, it creates a reality. Those words have changed the nature of reality. When you uh, name your children, you are creating a reality for them. My children are Arlie, Kennedy, Bro Treby, and Briley. Um, those aren't just name tags. That's who they are. When you stand at the altar, this is what a wedding vow does. When you stand at the altar and you say, I do, you have created the reality of a marriage that didn't exist before. That's how couples become married, by saying those words to each other. Not by, you know, changing your relational status on social media. Words perform. And in the earliest days of the church, the Apostles' Creed was actually how somebody was baptized into faith in Jesus Christ. They would, they would stand in the baptism tank with the pastor. The pastor would say, do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? They say, I believe. And he'd put them underwater. And he'd say, do you believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord, blah, blah, blah. I believe. And he'd put them underwater again. And then they'd say, do you believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, blah, blah, blah. I believe. And they put them underwater a third time. It was by declaring your faith in these things that you actually became a believer in Jesus Christ. In fact, a believer in Jesus Christ is someone who believes these things. So obviously not perfectly. We all have doubts and questions and things that are confusing and we don't get. But it is the act of believing these things on faith. That's how we are a believer in Jesus Christ. So what I want to do this morning is look at the Apostles' Creed in three parts and just kind of summarize the summary of what it means to believe in Jesus Christ. And it begins like this. The Apostles' Creed starts with these words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. That's the first part of the creed. And it says three things about God, and all three of them are problematic in their own way. It says, I believe in God the Father. Now, the language of Father is problematic for our 21st century ears because after years and years and years and centuries and millennia of patriarchy in the church, it runs the risk of communicating that God is an old white dude with a super long beard. And the earliest theologians and, and church fathers recognize that danger too. And they said, listen, we have to use the word father, but we have to use it in a way that does not imply or mean gender in any way. God doesn't have a body. God's a spirit. God's not a man. God is all gender. God, you know, so don't allow yourself to be, to think gender, but what, but I believe in God, the father, what the word father is, is a relational word. You can only be a father or a parent if you have a child. That's how you become a parent is by having a child. And what it means to be a child is somebody who emerged from parents. And so it indicates immediately 
that the defining characteristic of God is that God is the father of Jesus Christ. That God is the source and origin. God is the wellspring of the divinity that is Jesus Christ. What it indicates is that at God's very core, God is a relationship of love, of love towards Jesus Christ, God's son, and Jesus Christ loves God as the father because God is the source and the origin and the wellspring of the divinity that is Jesus. The amazing thing about beginning the creed right there is this, the implication that that is the invitation that we are being invited into as well. Through Jesus Christ, with Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, we are being invited to stand before God as our father. Jesus as God's natural child, all of us as God's adopted children, but God loving us and looking at us and listening to us in exactly the same way that he loves and looks at and listens to Jesus Christ. We're being invited to relate to God as our daddy. I believe in God the Father Almighty. The second word is problematic because it talks about God's power. And in our culture, when we talk about power, quite often what we talk about is the ability to coerce or manipulate or force or domineer somebody else into doing what they don't want to do, but into doing what you want them to do. It's corrupt power. We say Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. If God's almighty, he must be the most absolutely corrupt. No, no, this is not the way the early church fathers talked about God's power. When they talked about God's power, they compared God to a breastfeeding mother. The power of the mother is the motivation of love that becomes the sustenance, the nourishment, the nurture of the life of this child. The mother becomes the source of life, the very reason of this child's existence, the very thing that nurtures and nourishes and sustains and causes the child to flourish and to grow and to become. It is the power of God that doesn't just sit over us like a king over the subjects, but the power of God that comes alongside of us and is beneath us and is within us that nourishes us, sustains us, strengthens us, causes us to flourish and grow every moment of every day it is the power of God that empowers us to be God is the source and the origin of all the life and love that we experience as human beings throughout all of creation frankly And so God is the source and the origin of the divinity of Jesus as father. God is the source and the origin of life for the entire universe as mother. God is the source and the origin of the universe itself. God is the creator of heaven and earth. God is responsible for the reality and the being of everything that exists. And it is all, according to the Bible, Very good. One of the things that distinguished early Christianity from all the other religions in the ancient world was that it was life affirming and world affirming. It believed to its core that everything in the world is good at its core. Now that, you know, we look at the world and we say everything seems to be bad and getting worse, but that doesn't negate the fact that God created a world that was very good. When when I was younger, I spent a thousand dollars on a guitar because I thought if I spent a thousand dollars on a guitar, surely I'll be motivated to learn how to play it. And I uh, wasn't. So (laughs) if I were to pick up the guitar that is behind me um, and start to strum with you, you would say that is bad. And I think it's getting worse, but that is not the fault of the guitar. The guitar is good and beautiful. It is very good. When the guitar is misplayed, that's when it becomes very, the guitar doesn't become very bad. That's when evil badness emerges. If the world, to the degree the world is bad, to the degree that parts of reality are getting worse, it is because we are badly misplaying the creation and the lives that God has given us, which are very good. And so because that is true, 
Jesus enters into the story. This is the second and the longest part of the creed. It, it is not, the creed is not a bullet point list of things you have to believe. It is the story that centers around the main character who is Jesus. And this is what the creed says about Jesus. It says, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. What does the creed tell us about Jesus? It tells us that Jesus is God's son. And that means immediately two things. Number one, that Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. That the human being, Jesus of Nazareth, was the result ultimately of the direct creative activity of God in the life of Jesus' mother Mary. So Jesus has divinity infused in his very origins as a human being. And on the other hand, he was born of a virgin Mary. Jesus outside of the virgin part, which we can't get into today, Jesus entered into the world through exactly the same mechanism as every other human being that has ever lived. He entered into the world as a human being brought into the world by his human mother. The creed affirms that Jesus enters into the world that is a, as a being in which divinity and humanity is fused. What is that? mean. Uh, Use this as an analogy. I want you to think about an electric stove. It has to be electric, not gas. An electric stove that has that metal element. It's made of nichrome. uh, And that element, the stove is turned on to high and the element is glowing red hot. Right? On the one hand, that element is just a piece of metal. It's a, it's a, fabricated by common stuff in the cosmos. It's, it's a created thing. It's just a regular, ordinary piece of metal. But when it is connected to electricity and the power is turned on high and it's glowing red hot, it, it, it literally has become infused with the properties of fire such that you could cook on it. So the truth about that element is if you were to touch it when it was red hot, you are only coming into contact with a piece of metal, a regular piece of created stuff. And yet your entire experience would not be, oh, this is a piece of nichrome. And your experience would be that you would come in contact with fire. This is what Jesus' divine humanity, human divinity is like. On the one hand, Jesus is a truly human being. He's nothing but nichrome. And yet his life is so infused and permeated and radiating with divinity that every encounter with Jesus, the experience is that I am experiencing divinity. I'm touching fire. That's who Jesus is. And the creed suggests that that's who we were created to be. Human beings whose lives are filled with and permeated with and radiate the likeness of divinity into the world. But what was Jesus about? The creed goes on and it says this. I believe it says, I believe in Jesus Christ, son of God, blah, blah, blah. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified died and was buried. Jesus, the creed says, is the suffering one. Um, He suffered at the hands of the Roman Empire. It's a reminder that the world is corrupted, that when God shows up, the only thing the world doesn't have space for is God. That power is corrupt. Our systems are corrupt. Our political systems, our economic systems, our social systems are corrupt, our ideologies are corrupt, our isms are corrupt, that our world is controlled by forces that create, that are corrupted and create suffering for innocent people. And Jesus, the divine human being, entered into our world and entered into the suffering of innocent people who were suffering at the hands of the corruptions of our world. He didn't only suffer. He's not just the suffering one. He's the crucified one. The Roman empire perfected execution in the form of crucifixion. It was not just an act of physical torture, which it was. It was an act of psychological 
humiliation. It was the most shameful way to die in the ancient world. And in the honor-shame culture of the ancient world, honor-shame culture holds in many other parts of the world than in the Western world, to be shamed as a person, to bring shame on your family is actually a fate worse than death. You can die an honorable death and that is better than bringing shame on your family. To die a shameful death is the worst fate of all. It was in the Roman Empire, the death of revolutionaries and slaves, the, uh, of disobedient or runaway slaves. It was the death, the shameful execution of people who were not falling into line and going along with the program. Jesus is the one who entered into the suffering of suffering people. If you're suffering, he has entered into your suffering. And he entered into it as the one who in humility was willing to choose the death of a slave. So that people like us who were slaves to sin and death could be set free. He was the suffering one. And the crucified one, the one who modeled the humility of suffering even to death so that someone else could live. But he wasn't just the suffering and crucified one. The creed goes on to say that he was the resurrected and the reigning one. This is the, the next few lines. This is the longest section. It says he descended to the dead. And on the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Our, through death, we dragged Jesus down to the very depths of our depravity of the human condition. And having dragged Jesus all the way down to the grave, God through the spirit reached down and pulled Jesus out of the grave so that the story of Jesus doesn't end with sin and death. But there's another chapter in which what follows sin and death is light and life and hope. Sin and death is not the end of the story. With Jesus. In fact, Jesus went down to the grave and instead of being smothered by death, Jesus went down to the grave and he filled the grave with so much life that he started pulling people out of it. He is the one who guarantees that in Christ there is light and life and hope that follows sin and death. But he's not just the resurrected one. He's the reigning one. He ascended to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus, which is intended to mean Jesus is the one who is now in control of all of reality and who is in the course of time steering human history towards light and life and love until the day that he returns at the end of human history and he judges all of creation, which is not a scary word. To judge simply means to discern between good and bad and to remove the bad. So the only thing that's left is the good. Jesus will one day return and remove all evil out of creation and restore God's world to the very good creation and restore our lives to the very good thing that we were created to be human beings who are infused and permeated and radiate the divine life and love into the world. That's what Jesus did. And he does it through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the final part of the creed. It starts like this. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints. Jesus going, returning to heaven as a human being does not remove his presence from the world. In fact, Jesus says, going to be with the Father gives Jesus the authority by the power of the Holy Spirit to unleash his presence over the entire world. 2,000 years ago, the divine life was confined to one human being living in time and space. Now the divine life is available to all. And the, what the Holy, the Holy Spirit does three things. Number one, it recreates humanity. That's what it means when it talks about the Holy Catholic Church and the communion of the saints. The church is holy, not because it's 
morally pure. The word holy means distinct or set apart. The church is a gathering of humanity that is unlike any other gathering of humanity anywhere else in the world or anywhere else in human history because through Jesus Christ, it is living in relationship with God the Father and it is connected and filled with and infused with and permeated and radiating the divine life and love into the world. It is the Holy Church. It is the Catholic Church, not the Roman Catholic Church, though the Roman Catholic Church is a part of the church. The word Catholic just means universal. There is only one church in multiple expressions that is everywhere through all time for everybody bringing salvation to everything. God is doing that in and through the church. God doesn't save individuals through Jesus. God recreates humanity and invites us to join his recreated humanity by declaring our faith in Jesus. That's described by the creed. The church is universal. It is for everyone. There is no one ever anywhere in all of human history or anywhere in the globe that is not invited or the church is not for. There is no one who is excluded from the church for any reason ever when they put their faith in Jesus Christ. It's universal because it's not just for everybody everywhere. It's for all of life. It's not just what we do with the moral or spiritual side of our life. It's what we do with our body and what we do with our soul. It, it has to do with our physical life and our emotional life. It has to do with our relational life. It has to do with our individual life and our social life. It has to do with our political life and our economic life. What the way the spirit is recreating humanity in the church affects how we live in every way in God's world. He's recreating humanity, he's restoring humanity to God and to each other. The next line in the creed was added late. It just simply says, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Um, this line was added later because in the wake of a series of persecutions, there were Christians and even priests who, who denounced Jesus, re renounced their faith, who walked away from the whole thing. And then after the persecutions ended, they came back to the church and said, can we be a part of this again? And it raised this question for the church of, can somebody who has messed up so badly become a part of God's community again. And that's when the church added the line, we believe in the forgiveness of sins. The church is for everybody who has confessed a faith in Jesus Christ as described by scripture, summarized by the creed, no matter who they are or what they've done or how badly they've screwed up, there is no end to the amount of forgiveness and inclusion in God's grace through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit so that nobody ever gets excluded from the church ever, ever, ever. Some of you needed to be here this morning just to hear that. He recreates humanity, the spirit renews humanity. Thirdly, the spirit resurrects humanity. This is how the creed ends. It says, I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. The creed says that the very thing that happened to Jesus, who was swallowed up by the power of sin and death, but the Holy Spirit reached down into the grave and pulled Jesus out and raised him up to light and life and love. The very thing that happened to Jesus will happen to all of us. That we who have placed our faith in Jesus get to experience resurrection. The story of Jesus is that sin and death is not the end of the story. The story of Jesus is that there is hope, there is light, and there is life, and there's love after the, the, after the sin and death. Somebody has said, in our history, we are moving from birth to death with Christ. We are moving in the other way, from death to birth to new life. A new life that we experience already right now, today, in this moment, with this very breath. The Holy Spirit is making you new. 
so that in ever increasing ways you become a human being that reflects what Jesus is like to the world. A human life so infused and permeated with divinity that you literally radiate the life and love of God into the world and you experience the joy and the hope and the peace and the life of what it means to live your life playing the instrument of your life beautifully the way God intended it to be. It happens now and it happens later at the end of our life in the world. When Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead, he will raise those to life who have placed their faith in him. And we will spend eternity as people who have been recreated in the image of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit through the suffering, life, suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus to live in a relationship as God's children with God the Father for all of eternity. This is what it means to believe as a Christian. And let me say this as clearly as I know how. Any person who affirms these beliefs, beliefs with their mouth and with their life is a follower of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit, part of the church, um, on their way to a resurrection life like you have never even imagined. This is what it means for us to believe in Jesus Christ. May we become the thing that we have said that we believe. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the story of your love for creation, for us, that is told in the scriptures and summarized in the creed. May we not just believe it with our minds. May we embrace it in our hearts. And may it unfold with our very lives. By the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray to the glory of God the Father. Amen.